My involvement with the New South Wales prison system began two days after an interview I took part in was aired on Channel 7 concerning the treatment of a child with intractable epilepsy with medical cannabis. Uh, I think it was eight in the morning, I was sitting at the uh, kitchen table having a cup of tea when the front door was violently hammered on. I answered the door to find 12 police, most of them dressed in riot gear, and two of them preparing to use door hammers to, to smash the door in. Um, they, they entered the house and began a search. Now, if anyone's house has ever been searched by police, this, this is what to expect. They fan out in a paramilitary fashion, and they do what they call clearing the rooms to make sure there's no hidden threats or dangers in each room. So. Periodically, you could hear this sort of manic grunting coming from each room as the police cleared the room. At some stage during the search, it was obvious that the uh, laboratory that I had uh, been using for the interview was in the house, and on the basis of that alone, I was arrested and conveyed to Hornsby Lockup, where I was held for two days until I was granted um, magistrate's bail with a condition to report three times a week. Probably one of the most disturbing things about being arrested is being completely cut off from family, friends and supporters with no access to telephones or visits or anything like that. I will admit it was a great deal of uh, comfort to me when one of the police came in and sort of cursed the fact that there were dozens of supporters outside chanting slogans. And that, that gave me a great deal of strength and confidence. A month later, at my first mention, I explained to the magistrate that this was far from an ordinary drug case. It involved six children and medical cannabis, and he dropped the reporting conditions altogether. Some months later, the DPP decided to issue a detention application because they had upgraded my charges. The laws in New South Wales, called the admixture laws, state that no matter how little cannabis there is in a mixture of materials, uh, you're charged with the full amount. So the eight litres of dilute cannabis extract that I had for paediatric use was charged as though it was eight litres of cannabis resin. And the detention application was made, and as I was arrested then and there in the court, much to my surprise, Worse than that, as the sheriffs approached, I asked could I contact my family and I was told I couldn't. So there ensured a fight in the court while I was texting my family and holding off the two sheriffs with my fists and feet. So at least they knew that I was being arrested. After that, I was taken to Surrey Hills um, in handcuffs and held in a concrete cell in what any normal person would describe as a madhouse. Surrey Hills Detention Centre is full of people in all states of mental distress, uh, addiction withdrawal, violence, all sorts of things. It really satisfied the criteria of a madhouse. I was told I'd spend seven days there, so I straight away went into a hunger strike. Um, to get out of that place. Now, it wasn't hard to do a hunger strike at uh, Surrey Hills because the only food that was offered were things like sausage rolls or sort of three or four month old frozen sandwiches. So it wasn't, wasn't much of a difficulty there. After three days, I was con conveyed to Park Lee, a privatised jail, Park Lee, and I was held in a concrete cell, five by two metres, 
in solitary confinement for seven days before I was released to the pod where I was placed in a cell five by three metres with two other male prisoners. So three male prisoners were held in a five by three concrete box which included the open toilet and the shower. The most you could expect uh, would be to be let out for one hour each day into the exercise yard. At times of staff shortage or as an act of collective punishment, that one hour was often cancelled and you'd spend two, three or even more days on what they call lockdown when you could not leave the five by three concrete box. I was much more fortunate than the majority of people in the jail in that I had a large group of devoted supporters and I can't begin to express what a difference that makes to someone facing a potential life imprisonment in jail. The supporters provided me with legal documents um, which helped me to prepare the medical necessity defence which eventually secured my release. Two months I spent at Parkley uh, until I was granted magistrate's bail in January of um, last year. Everything was going well and I started preparing the legal grounds for a medical necessity defence but these preparations were disturbed when I was pulled off the highway in what I was told was a random um, drug and alcohol test but the fellows seemed to know my name so I don't think it was particularly random. <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, I was arrested on the basis of two 25 mil bottles of massage oil which the police um, insisted was cannabis oil even though I informed that it was massage oil. I was carted again in handcuffs to Cessnock uh, prison, a maximum security remand prison where the same thing repeated itself. I spent seven days in a concrete box in isolation before being moved to the pod where you spend the 23 hours a day in a concrete box five by three metres with two other people. The complete lack of caring by the prison staff for the well-being of the prisoners is on show all the time. Um, simple things like access to a quality library, um, access to uh, law link or any of those things that are required to properly prepare a defence are denied and normally denied in a most malicious sort of manner. Cruelty is a way of life there. If they can deprive you of your mail or make you wait for a visit, that's what will be done. Visits were interesting. I was fortunate, more so than many of the other prisoners, to be very well supported by friends, family and supporters. If you were to have a visit, it had to be booked a week in advance. Um, the prisoner exchanged their green shorts and t-shirt for a pair of white overalls which were placed on backwards and then ziplocked at the back so they couldn't be undone. If a prisoner was found with his arms inside of the sleeves, their visit was immediately cancelled and they were subject to a strip search and possibly solitary confinement. After the visit, all the prisoners were strip searched in, in, a, in a great long line supposedly looking for imported contraband, Park Lee and Cessnock, there would not, I can say without a shadow of contradiction, apart from my seven days in solitary confinement, there wasn't a day where I wasn't exposed to at-risk drug use. The amount of buprenorphine in the drugs, in the jails, is absolutely astounding. I say again, there wasn't a single day when I didn't witness at-risk drug use uh, including uh, group sharing of needles in the exercise yard and almost daily smoking of buprenorphine. The most worrying thing about the detention in Cessnock Jail and Park Lee Jail was the fact that they were both undergoing massive building programs. As far as you could look over the razor wire, you could see further lines and lines of razor wire. In fact, they've created something like three or four separate jails where Cessnock Jail alone stood. And this is a very, very worrying development. There's, uh, once you build a private jail, the next thing you're going to want to do is fill it 
with hapless victims, and that appears to be what's happening. Despite multiple conscience efforts by the prison guards to deprive me of access to lawyers, for instance, my visits would be cancelled after a lawyer would visit, uh, we did manage to organise a Supreme Court bail application, which was summarily refused. I then took it to the Court of Criminal Appeal and uh, ran a successful bail application. Then I had four months of uh, relative freedom with just three times a week reporting at the police station um, to organise a defence. Probably one of the most disturbing aspects of the entire experience has been uh, my exposure to various members of the legal profession. Uh, on the whole, they firstly d claim no knowledge of jury nullification and then deny that it no longer applies. Um, it was clear to me right from the beginning that there wasn't a single legal practitioner in this country that thought we were going to win the case. And the best I got was sort of sympathetic uh, looks and say, yeah, well, good luck, good luck, Andrew. <laughs> Um, I feel, at a metaphysical level and a spiritual level, that if you're doing the right thing, there'll be some level of protection. And um, I mean, I've, I've lived my life by that principle, and um, it stood me in good stead. I mean, I do work that I'm proud of. I do work that needs to be done. And the work that we've been doing over the last 20 years has now considerably broadened, and we can cheerfully say we're now part of a global movement. It may be a global movement that in a large part has been ignored by Australian medical practitioners and politicians and that's regrettable. Right? I mean Australia used to be an extremely progressive country. We should bear this in mind. Even though we had some disgraceful components to our history, uh, in many ways Australia was a progressive country. We introduced social legislation in the 20s and 30s. Uh, we limited the work hours, the uh, age of child labour, uh, women getting the vote. There was a lot of progressive social activity, but that seems to be forgotten now as we charge headlong into an increasingly repressive system, which I refer to as pharmacofascism. This is very clearly on show when it comes to the saliva testing. It is an affront to human dignity that a government will legalise cannabis for medical use and then ensure that anyone who avails themselves of this healing medicine are at grave risk of criminal prosecution under the road traffic rules. It's not the action of a progressive country to put in place limitations on their citizens that in no way benefit the common good. If saliva testing for cannabis improves safety on the roads, I would be 100% in favour of it. But it has no impact on, sa on safety on the roads. And as such, it's not an activity that we should be involved in, let alone being pushing the rest of the world into adopting. The, these are serious incursions into personal liberty and the difference between the treatment of allopathic drugs, like the impairment caused by, say, benzodiazepine or other sedative pharmaceutical drugs, is much greater than any potential impairment from cannabis. But these aren't included on the saliva testing panel. And that by itself really shows that this is a politically driven activity right, to suppress a natural healing herb and stop its widespread application. We really ought to learn the lessons of those progressive jurisdictions that legalise cannabis for recreational use. Within 12 months of changing the law in Colorado, there was a measurable decrease in suicides, in fatal traffic accidents and in domestic violence. Now these are major, major impacts and um, it behoves our lawmakers to look at them and exercise what human conscience they have and move forward in the same way. These are, this isn't the ravings of some um, unhinged hippie, but the serious sociological data that's been gathered in jurisdictions that have changed their cannabis laws. 
During my time in jail, I had plenty of time to study uh, the theoretical basis for how to run a medical necessity defence, and I learnt of the three elements of a medical necessity defence. Firstly, that it must be done to avoid the threat of severe illness or death, which in the case of intractable epilepsy was easily met. Next, there must be no reasonable alternative. And after managing or attempting to manage children with intractable epilepsy with conventional medication, it was very clear to me that there was no practical alternative to using medical cannabis in this group of patients. And the third condition for a medical necessity defence was that there must be proportion between the breaking of the law and the good that could be derived from it. Uh, the trial was complicated somewhat in that the first jury dismissed itself when there was an allegation that someone had taken a photo of the jury from the gallery. This didn't occur, but I was happy to see the next jury, which seemed to be rather more human. And over the course of the three-week trial, there was a certain amount of human interaction with the jury, although the judge tended to um, try to maintain a very sombre and severe sort of tone in the whole business. Now the three weeks that I spent in court were interesting. In the first week, the judge was clearly, if not hostile, at least unfriendly, uh, in a sense that I was treated as though I was a major drug dealer. By the second week, once started, some of the evidence had started to um, become obvious, the judge's attitude softened, and by the third week, um, I mean, <laughs> I have to say, he was uh, clearly on side with the provision of a medical necessity defence. He saw that the three elements were satisfied. In the preparation for the court case, the medical necessity court case, I approached several of the families whose children I had helped, and they all assured me that they'd present themselves and give evidence. But as the date for the court case became nearer, I received phone calls from the majority of them weeping generally and said they'd love to attend and help, but they were terrified of the consequences of facts, family community services becoming involved and the very real risk of having their children removed from their care. Um, I certainly had a great deal of sympathy for them and didn't insist, but the parents that remained, the, the stout-hearted parents that remained, were enough to convince the jury that what we were doing was not only morally correct, but medically correct as well. A jury trial is an interesting experience. You imagine being judged by a group of 12 strangers, which is what the jury are. The court procedure goes to great lengths to distance um, the defendant from the jury in any sort of emotional terms. They're sternly instructed not to do any research of their own on the internet, which by itself I think is an affront to justice. The rationale for that is that the courts don't want the decision to be made on any evidence that is not actually presented in the court. But without a broad understanding, for instance, of the medical uses of cannabis and its ability to reverse formerly intractable diseases, the um, real impact of a medical necessity defence can be lost. However, the cases that we presented were so unequivocally positive. Um, in the case of Disha, we had a letter from probably one of the more senior uh, paediatric neurologists in the country saying that that exhausted all forms of therapy and there was no reasonable expectation of anything other than a death in the near future. That carried a lot of weight considering Disha is now going to high school and doing fairly well. <laughs> the testimony of the parents of the afflicted children certainly carried the day with the jury. I was, I was encouraged that at the conclusion of the trial, the jury deliberated for only half an hour before marching back into the, um, the jury box smiling when the foreman announced in a very confident voice with his head held high that I was not, with a capital N-O-T, not guilty. And that was, that was repeated on each of the charges. <laughs> I don't like to gloat, but to see the expression on the, the police and the, the prosecutors made, made the four months in Cessnock worthwhile, I have to say.
<laughs> the whilst I invariably presented a totally optimistic demeanour during the whole court case, I must admit the 15 seconds between the jury foreman standing up and delivering his address was somewhat anxiety provoking. Um, I mean, I was reasonably confident, but one never knows. Uh, the word not rang out like a bell in my mind, and I could hear the supporters in the gallery breathing a collective sigh of relief before they burst into applause. But yes, yes, even, even my confidence uh, <laughs> suffered a tiny, temporary little dent. Um, <laughs> maybe that's a failing on my part, but I must admit there was that 10 seconds of breath-holding anxiety, hoping for the best. The value of the event of running the first successful medical necessity defence was reduced by the total absence of significant media reporting of what we do consider a very important legal precedent in this country. Since that time, we've run other medical necessity defences which hinge around the power of a jury to nullify or cancel the statute law. During my court case, and I must admit that Judge Jeffries was rather fair in his handling, and it's, it's a degree of fairness that's not often seen in the judiciary, but he allowed me virtually unfettered access to the jury to inform them that they had the power and the, un, the a power that couldn't be cancelled by any judicial officer to acquit if they felt that the law that was in action at that time was an oppressive law. Now, in other court cases, the judges haven't been so understanding of the ability of a defendant to inform the jury that they have an absolute right to give a verdict against the facts if they feel that the law is oppressive. And in fact, in the last case in Queensland, the judge would not even allow us to mention that the drug laws were oppressive. And that has now become the subject of a court of appeal appeal because we feel that the only way forward in this country is to use the power of the jury of the people with, with a power that's been in common law use for centuries, but in the last few decades and has fallen from use because of the suppression of the knowledge of the power of a jury to acquit on conscience. So that's an unfinished story at this stage and it will only come to completion, in my opinion, if we get unfettered access to a jury to inform them that if they feel that the person in the dock and the law under which they've been brought to that position are oppressive or unjust, they simply don't have to follow that law. Now, a judge has described, or judges generally, have described themselves to me as creatures of statute. Now, I interpret this and I inform them that does that mean you operate without a human conscience? If you're governed by the laws, you become a slave to the law rather than a servant of justice. And I feel that this is the critical way to go forward in this matter, to exercise a power that's inherent in the jury system. And it really gives us the only way out of this pharmacofascist system that has developed all around us. We've still got a long way to go, but I hope what I've done is in a small way of an encouragement to others to take the same level of defiance. Right? Bad laws must be opposed or they simply become worse laws. And that's what we're seeing here. Because of insufficient objection to the cannabis laws, we now have saliva testing, an unreasonable impost on civil liberties um, foisted on us by a group of police who are actually profiting financially from the sale of these devices, which a lot of people are now aware have not been properly tested and often give false positive results. So up to 20% of people who are actually charged under these laws are falsely charged and go through all the pain and anxiety that being charged brings with it. In order to give meaning to what I've gone through, 
these court cases must be repeated. So what I'm spending time doing is encouraging people not to take plea bargains, not to plead guilty to cannabis offences, but to resist, to plead not guilty and follow what avenues there are in the law um, and using the power of a jury to nullify the statute law. So even though I enjoy treating patients, the number of people that require treatment in this country is enormous across the broad range of uh, cannabis responsive conditions. And we must operate at the political level as well as the medical level. Now, the result of the recent federal Senate election uh, were very encouraging for us. The Hemp Party in New South Wales, I think we attracted 2.6% of the vote. Andrew Cavacillus in the Northern Territory got 4% of the vote. And whilst this isn't enormous, we were certainly the largest of the small parties. And considering the amount of time and effort we put into the campaign, it's given us a great deal of encouragement to consolidate our position politically and move forward and actually win a seat in Parliament and access to the microphone that the media at this stage is denying us. So yes, we're broadening our activity to the legal and political outside of the purely medical at this stage. This is my first book. Uh, the idea of writing this book uh, came to me while I was sitting in Park Lee Jail, having not much else to do, uh, because of restrictions on word processing and even basic writing material in the jails. It had to all be done in my head and written on a word processor once I got out. I feel it's in some ways valuable. There is um, a combination of my life's experiences, but more importantly, how I've arrived at the positions I hold on really important issues like medical cannabis, like euthanasia, like fluoridation, immunisation, all the issues that are heavily censored in this country at this stage. We can't have a rational discussion about immunisation without being labelled anti-vaxxers. Um, what I'm trying to do here is lay out the scientific basis in simple terminology for the positions that I hold on these controversial topics. I think it's valuable for a number of people and I hope in some ways it's somewhat amusing as well. I, I have to admit that the first three days of incarceration at the Surrey Hills Detention Centre were amongst the worst three days of my life. And it might sound strange, but the, the ghost of my dead grandmother appeared in the cell on three occasions and I derived, <laughs> no, I haven't lost my mind, that really did happen. And I derived a great deal of comfort. Her unspoken words were, this is a hard time, but you'll come through it and you'll come through it bigger and stronger than you went into it.